this is a project um, that I'll try and synthesize in 10 minutes. Um, CIFSURF is Canadian International a food, sec food Security Research Fund. This work is in the Caribbean, and I'm going to keep my um, remarks to one part of this in a small Caribbean island, which is uh, St. Kitts. Um, it's a collaboration between McGill University and the University of the West Indies in uh, Trinidad and funded by CEDA and IDRC Canada. So project background in very short um, few words is we're really trying to link agriculture, nutrition and health <clears throat> and looking at increased production of vegetables, fruits and animal forage through uh, drip irrigation. So there's a large component of this project is done on agriculture, but what I'm going to be showing you is looking at agriculture feeding into a school nutrition program. So the objectives of what I'm talking about today is to describe the nutritional health of primary school children and uh, changes in their diet as a result of school feeding and measure the extent to which we can really get farm produce into the school program to improve the school feeding program. So uh, these Caribbean countries all have supported, government supported school feeding programs that differ um, actually quite widely across the different islands. So in this, on this island there's 17 uh, primary schools and we randomly allocated seven. Um, really, we had four who had a menu change, and three were our controls, and, but in fact, the other uh, 10 schools are also controls. It's just that we're not measuring um, any uh, outcomes in those. So we have one, one big building that, um, very uh, simple kitchen, that provides foods for uh, 3,200 children, and the food is put in big buckets and moved around to the schools. So what are our nutritional outcomes? How are we gonna look at this, see if it has any impact? We have done a baseline survey, and we will do this winter a two-year follow-up, uh, 188 children uh, and their caregivers, and we've measured children's height, weight, caregivers' height, weight, uh, a 24-hour recall with each child with caregiver hemoglobin status. And what I really want to talk about today is where we're at, which is the process evaluation of implementation of this, linking agriculture to school feeding, uh, the cost, and the acceptance uh, from the children. So the one thing I'll give you from the baseline survey, just to situate this, because I've heard so much in the last couple of days about stunting. Um, this is the um, WHO Z scores for uh, height for age. These children are tall. There is no stunting. And BMI for age, there is 23% um, down here of children who are on the heavy side. So our problem is not a lack of growth. The problem is very much that these children are 23% are overweight, of their mothers about half are, are obese. So we're trying to prevent certainly um, the chronic diseases in this situation. This is, so the children aren't failing to grow but there is an awful lot of uh, food insecurity still in, uh, in this community. So school lunch, we have 3,200 children fed every day and the old menu had some, really as uh, the more we look at it, the more we see very good foods. Um, lots of beans. Uh, the meats aren't very appealing. They seem to be the leftovers from North America, all the turkey wings, um, hot dogs. And I've highlighted one, um, one vegetable, pumpkin, um, that's being offered now. And we're trying to get to through the uh, ruminant program and the forage for ruminants to get through the dry season, work in that area, uh, goat meat, which is quite traditional, uh, and 
than these other uh, vegetables, with the exception of banana, which we're putting into the school program, but we're not um, working on it in the agricultural part. So this neglected school feeding, and I, I use this because I think one point I wanted to make was that who's interest, who is interested in it? Uh, it's certainly not the Department of Education. They want to educate children well. They're not particularly interested in feeding them, and so they sort of leave it off to the side. The Ministry of Health, um, we finally got them to go in and inspect the school kitchen, and they started making changes because of uh, safety um, issues. Ministry of Agriculture is more interested because the school is a good outlet for increasing um, food production goes right into the school. The, the farmers have a market right away. And the condition of the kitchen, fortunately, um, with the sif -Surf funding, we were able to improve some aspects that um, really were quite forgotten about. So um, what can we do in, the wor in terms of process evaluation? Well, in trying to look at just is this happening? Are we getting the agricultural product into the school? Um, we had a few things we could look at. The first one is really almost a um, food, um, we're looking at all the food that's going in, um, I'm forgetting the term now, um, but the food su supplies, it's used, we're not sure that it's all used for children. As the food gets better, we find more teachers are eating the lunch, for sure. Um, but the, we could look at exactly what was being served by the log books from the kitchen as to what was issued from their storerooms. So we followed through on that and then looked at a two-week period and found, okay, we're getting watermelons in here, carrots, pumpkin, tomato, and cucumber. But part of the menu change was to try and improve some of the quality of the meat, and that worked very well. It was very much easier um, to buy a better box of meat than it is to peel 120 pounds of carrots or something. Um, we also looked at the food purchase records. So everybody has to, they buy their food either from the farmer or from uh, actually a supermarket. And um, we found that the new menu costs 70% more, um, and this is mainly due, though, to the improved meat and not so much due to the improved uh, quantity of vegetables. So I think modifications uh, probably need to be done there. But the, the scary one for us is that actually 29% of the food budget is spent on a sugar drink. So this is 96 pounds of sugar, uh, Kool-Aid, and then some bottled uh, fake juices, Sunquick or something. Um, and this is um, actually probably going to be quite hard to um, move out of the diet. And I think I haven't heard much in this whole conference about um, how the foods we have to take out of the diet. And as a nutritionist, I know we, if we add foods to the diet, we very often have to take things out, except in the context of, of course, not growing well. Um, and then the acceptance by the children. Um, we can look at waste. So we had some people in the schools just looking at what they left on their plates. Um, someone just came in at lunchtime randomly and looked at what was left on their plates. and. They like the familiar foods, they don't like the, the less familiar foods, and um, they may grow to like them, though. Um, so particularly the tomatoes and cucumbers. Um, and then by way of other observations, while we're doing this process evaluation, we see very clearly that there is an awful lot in the way of uh, sweets offered at school, either by the teachers selling it, we were invited to have ice cream cones with the principal one day because she sold ice cream every morning um, at 10.30 to, to the children. And um, 
if it's not in the school, it's right outside the school door. So um, this, our worry is that this is actually replacing what the children uh, are eating. Um, you see them with a, a good candy and then passing up the school lunch possibly. So overall lessons uh, from farm to fork. Certainly uh, others are looking at the farm and the increased uh, income that growing vegetables with um, drip irrigation is, is providing. So people are getting more um, income from this. It's a small number of farmers. Um, but our biggest challenge in getting the food from the farm into the school is really this inconsistent supply of fruits, vegetables, and even uh, the goat meat, which is sort of different. But the, um, the problem of fruits and vegetables, we would get, if everybody, if we had a farmer or several farmers planted watermelon at the same time, in three months we got mountains of watermelon and everybody got lots of watermelon and then we were sort of told, well, you won't have it for quite a while. So this idea of consistently providing food um, where it's possible, where the seasonality is not such that you can't do it, um, is really Im important. Um, there are losses, um, storage losses uh, for sure, um, because of this food coming in, in often quite big batches. In the kitchen, what we notice that's very difficult is an increased workload. If you're peeling 120 pounds of carrots versus 10 pounds of carrots, it's work. Uh, <clears throat> there is an increased cost, which we're still working on to try and shave that down and see where the, um, the things are that we don't need. Um, and then how do we get around this reducing sugar? Sugar, uh, this Caribbean island, um, their main product until 2005 when the sugar factory closed was sugar cane. So it's... Uh, it's a challenge, and you sort of say, well, let's take away the ch sugar drink, and everybody backs off. So um, it's, it's a challenge. But I wanted to give you this little micro version of what's happening from farm to fork, or the question is, is it fork to farm? Um, the dialogue has to be both ways, because certainly in a school situation, you need the food about 10 months a year on a very regular basis. You can adapt a menu, but you can only adapt it so far. So, um, thank you. That's the last slide. Yeah, thank you.